Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches is in the Oklahoma Proven Garden to look at the beautiful pintas. OSU campus horticulturalist John Stevens joins Casey to show how to create a barn quilt. We create a quilt planting in our concepts garden. We find out what is troubling our pear trees. And Barbara Brown has a great new kitchen gadget for making juices and jellies. If you're looking to attract those butterflies, there's no better annual to add, in my opinion, than the pentas. Pentas come in a range of colors, again, from pinks to whites to a rose color um, and some purples as well. Now, this is an annual, but you can see how nice of a shrub it gets. It gets about 16 inches tall and about 12 inches wide. What makes this even better for Oklahoma is once that heat cranks up, it will tolerate it really well. And in fact, it actually handles drier conditions as well. The Graffiti series is a new and improved series that you might look for specifically. Now you can deadhead these to encourage it to continue to bloom all season, but it's not necessary. But the butterflies are just going to be all over this plant. It's a great Oklahoma proven annual. Today we're joined once again by John Stevens, who is a horticulturist at OSU's Landscape Services. And I approached him a couple of months ago about designing a barn quilt for our garden shed. Barn quilts are becoming quite popular these days. And John, you just happen to be the guy that kind of knows how to make these for me, right? <laughs> and I have to tell you, it has turned out absolutely beautiful. Uh, I approached you a couple of months ago about a, a design and you told me, no, that's too complicated. <laughs> so we settled on this design. What is it about this design, John, that was a little more pleasing to you or acceptable versus the other one? <laughs> well, Casey, this is a nine patch pattern mm -hmm. that has half square triangles and just squares. And it's, it's on point here and all the points just radiate off, off that center point. So it was a lot more, it was a lot easier to manage than the one that you showed me. It had that, a few more straight lines in <laughs> yes, it. Yes, a few more straight lines. But the, if, if you want to, to get that complicated with your barn quilt, it's, you can. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people like to use um, applique, which would be like an animal print or oh, okay. maybe uh, a windmill. It just depends on the person building it, how creative they are, how, how much they want to invest in time and and working on this. And how experienced they are too. You, now you've made a couple of these. I kind of came to you knowing that you had, had built a few barn quilts. So, yes. Um, but this is one of your more intricate patterns, It is. Right? This is. This is one of the more intricate ones. For a beginner, I definitely recommend just sticking to the basic, just half square triangles and, and squares okay. and, and going from there. Okay. So the colors we chose were kind of based off of some of the colors we had seen. Um, but a lot of times you can get inspiration from different areas, your garden, your shed, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of aspects to look at. Sure, sure. So what did we have to think about with the proportion? I know you came out and measured our, our shed. Um, and this is, what is, are the measurements again on this one? This is 30 inches by 30 inches. Okay. And we chose this, these dimensions is because it just looked proportionate to our shed that we're doing. Okay. Now. A lot of people, they may have a big barn that's been in their family for years, and it may be a full sheet of plywood that you're using. to. Right. Like, like I said, this depends on how creative you want to be and how much you want to invest into Okay. The quilt. All right. So we wanted this to be low maintenance. We want to be able to hang it up and kind of leave it throughout the season. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of things we had to think about that in the process. Yes, definitely in Oklahoma, we have all kinds of weather and we have to deal with the wind. It's in our, it's in our state song <laughs> and, and we have the uh, heat, mm -hmm. this the intense summers and just constantly beating on, 
on the um, quilt itself. So we will need to talk about the materials that we get. So John, what are some of the first things we need to consider? Well, Casey, after we have settled on our pattern, mm -hmm. I recommend getting some graph paper and drawing the, uh, your design out on the graph paper. Because uh -huh. if you can draw it on the paper, then you uh, can transfer it onto, onto the wood. And you don't want to make mistakes on your wood once you have it all, all laid out. You want to have, have a, a good idea what you're getting into with your angles. When so you you've get... got your scale kind of drawn mm -hmm. out on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And so what kind of wood are we using? I mean, is this just regular plywood or it's thick? <laughs> well, that was by design. First off, this plywood is actually form ply plywood. Um, okay. It's like what construction workers use for pouring cement forms. It has, what's different about it is it has a smoother edge. It's, it's square. Um, so you didn't sand this or no, anything? Okay, because no, it is didn't. really smooth. Yeah, it comes just like that. You'll be happy with it when you get it. Um, our application that we're doing today is actually two pieces of plywood put together, and that was just our preference. Um, you know, just get a little more bulk. Yeah, if I had a quilt, I'd want a nice thick quilt too. So why not my barn okay. wanting one too? Okay. So we All chose right. that. So John, if this is double ply, how did you actually attach those two pieces together? Because I'm not seeing any screw holes sure. or anything. Sure. Like well, on the back side, we first off we put glue, carpenter's okay. glue, okay. all over it, and then put the two pieces together by having screws spaced out about six inches apart all the way across okay. the okay. the back of the board. So the screws are on the back side, mm -hmm. so, you so won't they're see not them. seen. Mm -hmm. You don't have any texture problems or anything mm -hmm. like that with the paint. Okay, excellent. So the next thing we got to do is start. Drawing our design on yes, there? yes. You want to draw you want to draw your design out first uh, onto the with pencil okay. on onto the plywood first, and I recommend using um, a metal a ruler, straight edge of some kind. I like the metal ones just because they don't have you'll have a, a more truer line. Yeah, and, and a you, long one too. A long right? one. You, <laughs> so it needs to be a long one. Yes. Yeah. Or you can use a T square. Okay. Or just whatever you have lying around. Okay. Um, and then once you have have the design pattern all drawn out, mm -hmm. you want to then take your masking tape and start uh, sectioning off the, okay. the pieces, the triangles. Okay. All right. So you do that based off of which color you're going to paint first, yes. or it, and you only start with one color. Is that what you? Try I recommend. To do? I, I recommend starting with one color and just have patience. Okay. If you, the more colors you have, the more patience you're going to need because okay. you'll want to paint each triangle, each section, and let it thoroughly dry, and then you may have to come back and reapply another coat okay. down the road. In so. case you pull that tape and it, it kind of... <laughs> in case, yeah, in case you have some, some streaks, okay, which excellent. it happens. Excellent. So, John, after we've used the exterior paint, we've got it all laid out and, and painted. Is there any sort of covering we need to put on to protect that paint or, I mean, a, a gloss or anything else? For the, coat? For the final, final finished product that we need to do, you want to put a clear coat in okay. And then that too can be a gloss or a matte, just whatever your preference is. So that just kind of seals it It then? seals it, yes. And just one more layer of protection. You, know, you already have your exterior paint that's made for outside, but if you put the clear coat on it, just be one more layer of protection. Okay. The, and I know as we've talked through this, it sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but obviously I would imagine the more colors and the, and it takes a while to it draw does. out your design. The one I built for you took two weeks okay. to build from start to finish. Okay. And it so was a lot So the more colors you have, the more you have to wait between drawing yes. and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. as well. Excellent. Okay. So two weeks for that design. And so now we're at the point that we can hang it. How are we going to go about hanging that? Well, we're going to put a blanket on the table so we okay. can flip it over. We don't want to damage our pattern. And then we are going to uh, put the hardware on the back of the, okay. of the quilt. All right. All right, John. So I, I want orange on top. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to mount it, I guess, up here? Is we that do. We need to flip it over. Side? Okay. And we decided that <clears throat> we're going to mount our barn quilt where it's like a diamond shape. So we're going to stick it in the corner. In the corner, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we, we chose these, uh, we're using a clamp bracket to, to mount it because of, like I said, the Oklahoma wind. Right. Um, you want, and it also helps with people with theft. You don't want someone to just come up and grab your barn. Okay. And run. At least make it challenging for yeah. them. So we're going to mount this in the corner. You want to check to make sure that it's hidden behind the quilt. You don't want the silver stuff exposed. Okay. So we're going to mount it right here. And our shed is ready for a quilt. 
John, it looks fantastic. And I have to say, it takes on a whole different look being up on the barn. Tell me a little bit about how you secured it up there for us. Well, Casey, when we got to this point right here, you want to make sure that you're um, attaching your hardware to a stud and not just uh, not just thin sheets of uh, plywood or uh, siding. Yeah, right? and our stud wasn't lined up right there, so you went in and... Yeah, we added a two by four and okay. just connected it to the, to the two studs that were in okay. the walls already. Right. And then uh, just measure twice, and so we're only drilling one hole in the, <laughs> in the side of the building. And, right, right. And then when we did that, we didn't do it on this application because we don't think there'll be that much wind movement in here, but if you're out in the open, you want to maybe put a small tack nail at the bottom of the quilt to keep it from swaying and okay. just um, it, it would be a really strong Oklahoma wind that would do that. Okay. But, but we're kind of protected here amongst the trees and yes. everything. Mm -hmm. So what did you attach to the barn then in order for us to hook that hook onto the barn? Uh, it was just a U, U hook that we just got at the hardware store. Okay. So just, just another mm -hmm. U hook that you attached mm -hmm. to the barn and then we were able to clip the barn quilt on there. Yep. Excellent. Well, it looks fabulous, John. You did great work, and, and I definitely think it has added another level to our garden shed. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, adding a barn quilt is one way to decorate your garden shed. There's another way to add those geometric shapes into your garden, and that's by building a quilt garden as we've done here. You're first going to look for a flat or maybe a slightly sloped full sun location. Full sun is best to take advantage of all the spectrum of annuals that you could use to add color into your quilt garden. After you've identified a location that you have space to create a quilt garden, you're going to start looking for that quilt pattern that you want to replicate. We've made our quilt block a 10 by 10 foot plot just to help make the math a little bit easier. Yes, just like quilting, there is a little bit of measuring involved, but unlike quilting, we're talking about plants here, so it's not going to be quite as precise. For this particular pattern, we actually only needed three different colors or three different types of plants to use, which allowed us to have a more simple layout because it can get pretty complicated. The other thing is if it's too complicated and depending on the overall size of your quilt garden, it can start to look a little messy and, and it may just look more like an annual mixed bed than it does a quilt pattern. For our design, we used a double pinwheel quilt pattern, or also known as a turnstile. What I like best about this pattern is it's really about finding the center of your measurements and dividing it in half. We began by using the 345 method to create a 10 by 10 square. Using several stakes and some string, we divided that square into four quarters. Then we split those quarters into half by pulling our string diagonally across the square in both directions. Finally, we drew the string across the quarters again diagonally from the center stakes on each side. Now on that last diagonal line, we have to remember that we are only going to pay attention to the line that is going through every other triangle. At this point, you can see how even a simple pattern can start to look complicated, and it's a bit of a tripping hazard to try to get in there and plant with all these strings going different directions. So to make it easier, using the lines, we marked with landscape paint the pattern on the ground. Once you have the pattern marked and you're happy with the layout, it's time to remove the stakes and string and begin to plant. For our quilt, we're using three different annuals. Cherry Red Angelonia will be the four large triangles and the other four triangles will be divided into half with Helen Von Stein's Lands Ear and Bumble Blue Adjuratum. For ease of planning, we want to work from the center out, so we started with the lamb's ear, next we planted the angelonia, and then finished with the ageratum that was easier to reach from the perimeter. Like all good quilts need a finished border, we added some metal edging to ours and applied a little mulch to complete the look. If you're looking for a fun new way to add some color into your garden or perhaps a signature piece that combines two of your hobbies, try planting a quilt garden.
If you look at this pear tree from a distance, you might not notice that it has any major problems. But when we get a little bit closer, we can start to see that some of the leaves and fruits have unusual blemishes and structures. This disease on this ornamental pear is a rust disease. And I don't know exactly which rust it is. There's about four possibilities. It could be cedar hawthorn rust, cedar apple rust, uh, Asian pear rust, or cedar quince rust. It's really hard to distinguish them on this broadleaf host. So what is this rust disease and is it a problem? Uh, what it is, is back in March or April, there were spores that blew onto these leaves and fruits and started these little infections. And probably didn't notice them. Over time, they've gotten bigger and bigger. And by the time we reach the end of June and into July, we start, it, it starts to become a lot more obvious because this fungus is pretty much done with what it's going to do on this tree. And so it will start to produce these under the underside of the leaf or on the surface of the fruits, sort of a little bump or pustule. And then it's going to, from that little pustule, that erupted area, you'll start to see these little white projections or tubes. And that is where the spores of this gymnosporangium species are going to tumble out and blow to a different plant. So in order for this fungus to complete its life cycle, it survives part of the time on a plant in the Rosaceae family, in this case, the pear, and part of its time on plants in, that are in, a, in Oklahoma, it's usually junipers. So juniperous species like Eastern red cedar. And at that time, it'll make some kind of orange structure or goo or swelling on those juniperus that are going to blow and infect the broadleaf host. So in, it could be a pear, an apple, a quince. Um, so if you don't like how this looks, there's nothing you can do about it this year. But next spring, when this tree or other plants in your landscape in the Rosaceae family start to produce leaves and flowers, that would be the time to apply a preventative fungicide application. And if we have a rainy spring, you may have to make two, three applications of that fungicide about 10 days apart in order to prevent all these blemishes from developing later in the summer. So overall, I don't really think this disease poses much of a threat for the health of this tree. Yeah, there's some blemishes on the leaves, but we don't see a lot of leaf drop or dieback or decline as a result. It's mostly healthy, and so it's just more if you find it visually unappealing. Now, if you have an edible pear or an apple, and your fruits like, look like this, they're not gonna look very appetizing. And so for those edible fruits, you may want to apply fungicides to prevent this sort of damage from happening to those fruits. If you are worried about the disease on the juniper host, again, it's not usually a major health threat. It's more cosmetic. There may be a couple of weeks where your ornamental juniper doesn't look that pretty because it has the orange gooey substance. And this would be the time when you're seeing this fungus release spores to treat those juniperous species. So how do I know if it's releasing spores? I can pluck off some of the leaves or fruits, tap them on something white, a paper towel, a Kleenex, and see if spores are coming out. Then that's the right time to make sure that we're treating those conifer hosts if you're concerned about the blemishes there. So for more information, we have a fact sheet and also a pest alert that you can read more about the life cycle of these unusual fungi. Research shows that canning is still very popular for many people at home. However, we're not seeing the kinds of canning done that we saw many, many years ago where it was meat and potatoes and vegetables that were going in. 
it's more apt to be jams, jellies, and pickles. So if you're doing jams, or particularly jellies, one of the first things you're going to have to do is extract juice. We have some traditional methods, which you can see some of the tools behind me. However, I'm going to show you how to use a steam juice extractor today, which is a new piece of equipment. It's not tremendously expensive. It does take, take up a little bit of room, but it makes great juice. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. This is a three-piece unit. Uh, it, there's a base that you fill pretty well with water. Uh, and on top of that, there's another level of pan. Now this one has a hole in the bottom so that the steam we're creating here can come up through there. Uh, and then there's one that's like a colander. Uh, that goes on next. And we're going to put our fruit or our vegetable in there. Uh, and the steam is going to come up and cook that. The juice is going to come out, collect here, come down the tube, and it comes out perfectly clear and gorgeous. So you don't have to use any of the cheesecloth and those kinds of things, which can take a lot of time. Cooking on this may take eh, 30 minutes or more, depending on what you're trying to juice. Uh, but it's extremely efficient, extremely easy to do. So we're just going to stack these together. And you notice there's a tube coming out here. This is where the juice is going to come. It's got a clamp on it so that the juice is not going to be coming out uh, until we're ready for that to happen. Got the fruit ready. Now, today I'm making a strawberry juice. You could use uh, most any kind of fruit. Peaches are great. Apples are great. You can also mix different kinds of fruit. Now these berries are soft and so I don't need to do anything to them. The same with grapes. I don't need to do anything with those either other than rinse them off. You don't have to take them off the stems. You don't have to take the caps off. With apples and harder fruits like pears, I'd probably uh, cut them in half or quarters, but I don't have to peel, I don't have to take the stem off, and I don't have to core. Uh, so it saves a lot of steps uh, early on in the beginning. Uh, this is gonna go in here, see if we can get the fruit in. I've already got it going on a, a fairly high heat down here. In fact, it's on the highest heat I can get because we just want the steam to come up and cook them. Uh, put the lid on. Try not to peek into it very often because we do need that steam in there to, to do the cooking down. It'll take, as I said, probably 25, 30 minutes before we start seeing the juice come out the tube. And then you can continue to cook them after that. Now, one of, uh, to get more juice. Now, one of the things that you do want to know, however, is because we're going to be cooking them for a fairly long time, with strawberries, which are very low pectin anyway, or peaches or uh, some other fruits that tend not to have a lot of pectin. If you, the longer you cook them, the more pectin you're going to lose. It's going to break down. Uh, so you're going to want to use a commercial pectin uh, when you make the juice this way. Uh, and that's fairly common with most things, with the exception of some things like sand plums or other kind of plums uh, and conco grapes. Pretty much you're going to use a commercial pectin with them. Once you get the juice, you can see how the juice is coming down the tube. Put it over another vessel that you can capture it in. It can be a bowl. It doesn't have to be a measuring cup by any means. Uh, but you want to transfer this into something. Uh, and it's easier if it's going downhill. You may end up having to tip it a little bit, but you can see all the juice we got. And I've done nothing uh, to get this juice other than put the berries in there and, and let them cook down for about a half an hour. So. Uh, depending on what you're going to do with this. Now you can use this juice simply as a beverage uh, or you can can it or you can make jelly right from it uh, right away. I'm going to stop it at that point. Now if you're going to make uh, can it or make jelly from it, uh, well, particularly if you're going to can it, you want to make sure that you do it hot. Uh, this, because it's hot, if you put it into a jar right now, it will seal that jar. Uh, but the jar will not be care uh, properly processed, so you're going to have to put it into a boiling water canner. The same way you would if you were going to keep your jelly on the shelf, uh, if you're going to keep this juice on the shelf, it's got to go through a boiling water canner process in order to make it safe to use and stay safe to store that way. You can, however, store it in the refrigerator. You could actually freeze it if you wanted to do that, just leave more room on headspace. It's a great way to make juice. It's a great way to make jelly. Uh, and it gives you lots of options for uh, combining different flavors. One of the things I like with strawberry is to mix it with some rhubarb. Uh, and that makes a really good jelly later on. I hope you'll give this a try. It's a steam juice extractor. Broke Home Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead.
next week will not be aired on the main OETA channel to make room for August Fest programming. But you can find us on the OETA Oakla channel with a couple of our favorite episodes. We encourage you to consider supporting OETA during their fundraiser. And we hope you join us back here August 23rd for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.